Hey guys, I want to welcome you and let you know how great it is to have you here for the Greater Purpose Podcast. What's with the Cubs stuff? You're in the Cubs room. Here we are on the great on the Greater Purpose Podcast. And my producer decided to actually appear. Um, if you've watched the podcast before now, you've seen a uh, head pop out or an arm or whatever. But now he's actually sitting here. So here he is. This is Stephen Wright, our producer. Yeah, I even had my head cut off in the first yeah, one. Yeah, in the first one, different. yeah. If you watch the right. first one. Yeah. So and we have a, a wonderful guest joining us today, Hal Weatherman. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh no! Well, it just, I, oh, we do it like this. Yeah, it automatically no. does it. He it's, changes stuff on me. He doesn't yeah, tell me. I don't know. Automatic do these things. All right. Yeah. So when cool. he speaks, we'll see. So real quick, we don't want you to give too many details because we're going to get into all those as we go forward. But tell us uh, who Hal Weatherman is. Uh, in the simplest form, I'm I'm 53 years old. Uh, I'm married. I've been married for 19 years. My wife is Michelle. I call her Shelly. Um, have three kids. Uh, all teens, three teens in the house. So you can imagine what that's like. Wow. Um, my goodness. Wow. My that. oldest boy. Yeah. My oldest boy is uh, 18, about to go to college uh, this fall. And then um, my middle boy is 15 and my little girl is 13. So, uh, and we live in Wake Forest, North Carolina. And um, yeah. yeah, that's who I am. All, all the accolades for all those teenagers there. Ooh, yeah. A bit of a spread there. So, yeah. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. <laughs> If you're not already a praying man before that, you are a praying man now, right? Every day. <laughs> Every day. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, all right. Well, listen, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some serious stuff. We're gonna have some fun, all that kind of good stuff. But first of all, I I like to kind of tell a little bit about why I asked someone to be on the podcast. We just started that here recently. But um, so I've encountered you at GOP events and that kind of thing. Uh, this is not a political uh political um podcast, but you know what? Politics and faith, as far as I'm concerned, are tied together. So uh, you are running for lieutenant governor. We appreciate the godly you. representation out there. Yep, yes. that's awesome. Uh, and I know you're a great campaigner, and that was fantastic. But what struck me was at the GOP convention when you gave your gave your presentation to the audience there, um, the godliness of your life that came through your words that was so genuine and legit. Um, I hear a lot of people and a lot of people have a difficulty with that, you know, because they don't want to act like they're like it's on their shoulder. Uh, it's really hard to present yourself in a certain way. But you came you 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 could have pre you could have been the preacher up there that day. It was okay. awesome. And I was I was totally impressed by that. So um, not that not that that means anything that I'm impressed, but you know what I'm saying. So that's why we asked you to come on here. So we do appreciate the godly representation that you you are out there for us. So and we're regardless of what side of the aisle you're on we're pulling for this guy right here so okay all right so um should we do any of this other yeah. stuff first yeah you do? okay in the back all right so we got yeah we got to get we got to get the willie ace uh, bobblehead in there first is that does it look like anybody you've ever seen before looks like you there yeah you ah, there you go so <laughs> he knows what's happening here. yeah he knows so this is, yeah the willie ace bobblehead he makes an appearance in every podcast we got to have him in there because yeah. it is the cubs room right. so and hal's already promised he's going to come back to the cubs room Woo if you want me to edit that out i will that way you will. no no I, I want to come back. i'm a memorabilia collector that's what i told you like I, i'm a serious memorabilia collector well you can bring other things into the cubs room but they can't stay <laughs> they have to leave uh, unless it's cubs related uh, okay. it has to be cubs related Everything in here is Cubs related. So, uh, but anyway, and uh, I'm going to wait for the parting gifts until later. Yeah. Let's wait. Okay. We'll tell you about Sounds your like parting gifts. So, so let's get started here. So when did you first um, recognize the importance of, of being a godly man? So, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad both were believers. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of when it really kind of, and I became a, a believer when I was very young. Um, heard a sermon at um, Northside Baptist Church, if you know about Charlotte, um, during the 1970s, kind of the legendary Jack Hudson, who was um, a fire and brimstone preacher uh, of great renown. People knew him all over the country, um, is the church that we went to and heard a sermon and he preached about hell, I'm just being honest, and, and scared me to death and came home and talked to my dad about it, even though I was uh, about five and a half years old, told him that that 
that meant something to me and I don't know what to do. And, and so he sat me down in the library of my, of our home and, uh, got me down my knees and we prayed and accepted Jesus. And, and, and so, you know, I was blessed at, to be in a home like that, but I would say when, uh, when it became real personal to me was older in life. Um, when I went to Charlotte Christian school, I went to three different high schools, mm-hmm. uh, which was hard. You know, it's hard when you're a teenager switching schools. And um, the school I graduated from was a Christian school. I'd never been to a Christian school before. I'd always gone to traditional public school. And again, I lived in a Christian home, but there was something about day in and day out being around my peers and honestly, my teachers and athletes. I was an athlete um, being around people that believe the same thing I did, but I saw them, you know, integrating it more into what I would call their secular life more than what I was used to, if if that makes sense. And I liked it. Mm-hmm. And started to embrace that, be a little more open, not so close knit about what I believe and felt welcomed uh, by that community. And um, I don't know, you know, in so many ways, like you said, you know, I'm in the political world. I never set out to be in the political world at all. Right. But when I was at Charlotte Christian School, as I started to embrace that lifestyle, um, things just clicked for me. And that's how God works. I think, it, I mean, everything started to click. It's where I met Sue Myrick. She was, um, she had just run for mayor. She was running for mayor of the city of Charlotte. And I met her. And through those connections, when I think I was living right and my heart was right and I was integrating it into my life because of all the people that were around me showing me the way, um, you know, I, I teamed up with her and, and helped her on her mayor's race at age 16, 17 years old. Yeah. Not knowing that that, connection was going to lead me to basically almost 30 years of service to her and her family. Right. Um, so I can look back on it now and say that that was probably the most pivotal point in my life where faith was truly not just embraced and I accepted Jesus and all that, but actually started integrating it into, again, what I call the secular world into my secular life, not just on Sunday. Right. And so, uh, you know, give a lot of credit to the school itself. Right. Uh, for what it instilled in me and provided me. Yeah, cool. That's great. Yeah. And uh, I think everybody knows that Sue Meyer, Sue Meyer was a strong Christian. She was very, um, very inspirational to a lot of people, too. So that's that's a great tie in. So, yes. so I, I don't know if that will tie into this question or not. But uh, so who was your biggest inspiration as far as knowing, understanding, realizing that you needed to step out and and be that godly young man or, or young person, young man at the time when you, when you realize that. Man, I would always, I would still always start with my mom and dad um, Mm -hmm. because they really, you know, not just practicing Christians, but they lived, you know, lived it every day. Um, uh, My dad was an ordained deacon uh, in the church. So, I mean, I grew up in in a very small um, church and it was integrated into our life. So I can't get away from my mom, my dad. I should also know, you know, my dad wasn't, when my mom and dad got uh, married, um, my dad wasn't a Christian. My mom was. And, um, and you know, I've talked about it since then. I've talked with him about it. But, you know, obviously she was, as the Bible would say, they were unequally yoked. Mm-hmm. And, um, but through her influence, very quiet influence, um, he became a Christian uh, in his 30s. Awesome. And, um, you know, I vaguely remember I vaguely remember I was so young, but I do remember the change in my dad. Yeah. um, Very distinctly. And and it was, you know, because of my mom. And so, you know, but my father then grew up, you know, it just really paved the way, you know, of leading our family in a godly way. And uh, but I I attribute both of it to them because, you know, the one unit they've been married for almost 60 years now and uh, have really, you know, shown just the influence of the day in and day out. How do you live the quiet life? Right. Um, and, and I thought it was great, but you know, I, again, I would go back to Charlotte Christian school in terms of other people that were influenced to me during that pivotal time when I was 16, 17 years old at Charlotte Christian, you know, I would lift up people uh, today, uh, Jerry Hubbard, who was the headmaster at that school. Um, I know your viewers, that these names won't mean anything to them. Um, uh, Van Wade, who was my favorite um, teacher. I even, I talked to him maybe right after I got into my race. Uh, we He reached out or I reached out to him. We were just talking. I said, you know, you were my favorite teacher. Wow. Of all time. That's great. Um, because he, he integrated um, 
just uh, current events, current affairs from a biblical worldview into my life to where you started seeing, you started looking at the world through a prism, uh, a godly prism, um, but also encouraged me to, to get involved um, in some way um, in, in culture building or, or culture, you know, molding from a biblical worldview. And then I would lift up a guy named uh, Dr. Rod, Ron Thomas, who was the guidance counselor yeah. um, at Charlotte Christian School, who really took an interest in my life um, in a very strange way, but really knew I was interested in politics, even at that early age, and just kind of took me by the hand and gave me opportunities outside of the classroom. Like, you know, I know you want to go into politics. Maybe you need to go over uh, to this rally or uh, mm -hmm. on election night. Let, I'm going to get a group of kids with you and I, I'll take you all down to the Grady Cole Center, which is where they used to keep the election results on, on election. Right. And just exposed me to it. They didn't have to do that. Yeah. You know, I look back on it now and I realize that was his mentorship. He, you know, he probably did the same similar thing with other kids with whatever their interest was. For me, it was politics. Yeah. And uh, he breathed life into that. I didn't come from a political family. So my family was it's not that they were apolitical. They just they were, they were conservative and they did their own. And they voted. But right. we weren't involved. With I had no clue how to get started or anything. But wow. it was these these men uh, at that school on top of my parents and their support and their godly, you know, living. Right. But really those men just kind of breathe life into my, my burgeoning interest in politics in right. a way that now that I look back on it, I'm like, wow, but yeah. for these men, I would not have ever gone into this career career. I would not be running for Lieutenant governor of the great state of North Carolina now, for the, but for these men, 40 some years, 30 some years ago. Right. And so uh, I never miss the opportunity to point that out to them. If I see them. Sure. Um, because it means a lot to me, you know? Well, and that's, that's an important part of what we're doing. Um, uh, we have a, a greater purpose of a godly man conference. We've got these greater purpose, uh, podcasts, and that's kind of, kind of where we're coming from. Uh, we do these men's breakfasts. We do all kinds of men's ministry kind of things. And that's, that's kind of, that's kind of why we do it because we are set, we are, we're set apart, of course, but we we're supposed to be motivating, inspire, inspiring, motivating, uh, encouraging other men, young boys, uh, yeah. to become what God wants them to be. A lot yeah. of them, they may not ever have that guidance. Um, yeah. So if we don't step out and do what God tells us to do right. as godly men, yeah. then guys like you aren't going to step out what the, what they're supposed to do at the time that they're supposed to do it. So that yeah. was really, all of that was really great. That was loaded, man. There was so much stuff in there. I could pick that apart and we could spend about 40 minutes on all that. But I did, I did one of those examples, the teacher, Van, the Van one that, Wade. Van Wade, mm -hmm. who's, who you said, how important is it that we go back to someone who has done that and say to them what an inspiration that they are? A lot of guys don't think about that. But that's a big deal when somebody comes back to you and says, hey, you inspired me. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he knows that because as he got older, you know, uh, we're all as we all age. Um, Wait a minute. We age <laughs> for a while there. We sent um, when we lived in we, I, we've moved now. We live in Raleigh. But when we lived in the Charlotte area, um, I sent two of my kids to his school. I didn't send them to, to nothing against my old alma mater, but I sent them to another Christian school right. in part because he had switched over to that school and become the headmaster. Oh, cool. And as much as I love, I mean, I was a student body president at Charlotte Christian School. I absolutely love the school. It's still a great school, but I wanted my kids to be, to have his influence on their life. And I told him that the day we trained, which was a big deal for my family to go to that another school. That's great. Um, yeah. But, I, it, you know, it was less the school and it was more the people that were at the school right. that, um, you know, and I wanted my kids to be to be in that influence of him. So he knows this. I mean, that and that was when my children were, you know, first grade. And I'm, right. like, no, I'm sending them here because I want I want them to be around you because I know how you lead. Well, and that's so it good. Is a great testimony to him. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's right. I guess that's the point I was trying to make is the fact that you did that is is awesome because a lot of men don't do that. A lot of guys don't do that. They don't they don't go back and 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 encourage someone who encouraged them. I yeah. don't know if you feel like we shouldn't or can't or it's not necessary, but it's extremely necessary. So that's that is pretty cool right there. So um, so how do you feel like you personally are? Uh, what is how are you most effective? at affecting 
and motivating and building into the lives of other young men or older men or boys? You know, I would say my profession has enabled me, if you know anything about politics, you know, it's cyclical on a two year cycle or four year cycle. And it's a young man's game. It really is. Um, the campaign process itself is a young man's game. Right. And uh, or a young woman, uh, just young person, because it's labor intensive, uh, a lot of travel, late hours, low pay, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it, it attracts young people uh, in part because they don't have the families yet. And so, you know, I remember the day when I was the young man on the totem pole. And then, you know, it's been quite some time since I needed <laughs> that qualification. Um, but as time went on, you know, I had the experience, but yet the young people were still coming in to whatever campaign we were assembling or whatever. And so it's given me great exposure um, to young people, people younger than me, most of them trying to find their way, whether in politics or whatever. But for whatever reason, we were brought together during that campaign. And campaigns are like, I don't want to equate it to battle, but, it, you know, it's, it's stressful. Yeah. You do bond with the people around you in a very hyper intense way. And then it's over win, lose or draw it's over. And so there is a bond with all the people and, and you can link them back to what campaign you served on. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, you know, the mentoring, you know, I never set out to be a mentor. I don't claim to be a mentor, but uh, I certainly um, try to return the favors that were done to me by the men that I mentioned previously by doing the same thing for, to the young men and women that are around me. Um, I, I run my campaign certain ways. I get a lot of criticism uh, from the consulting world about how I run campaigns. I don't rip people to shreds. I don't do negative campaigning. I don't do any of that. Um, and I'm willing to take the, the responsibility for that, even in defeat. I know we're not talking politics, but I think the important point is, you know, every campaign, everybody that's been on any of my campaigns knows that I believe strongly that we're all going to have to give an account one day. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to give an account that I was given this great opportunity. Yes, sir. And I spent my time ripping people to shreds. Right. Yep. And, you know, you can lose races that way. I get it. I'm going to live my life a certain way. And I sleep with a clear conscience every night. And I come home and I'm not ashamed to tell my wife anything that I did politically that day uh, or my mom or anybody else or my children. Awesome. And, you know, I'm not perfect. And in that hyper intense environment, there are times I blow my top like that next guy. And but at the end of the day, I think that it has given me a great opportunity to share to the next generation of people who might be going into the same kind of what I call culture influencing from a biblical worldview. Um, hey, that you don't have to do it this way. Don't give in. You know, peer pressure doesn't end when you get out of school. Peer pressure is through your life. It's yeah. in your profession. As you know, it's it's everywhere. Yeah. That don't listen to uh, the pundits. Don't listen to whoever else. Um, if you felt led to be in this campaign or in this um, profession, then uh, do it the right way. Do it the right way or it'll consume you. It'll absolutely chew you up. And I do think that's part of my longevity in the business. That's you know, right. I'm getting older and I've been in it, you know, one way or, or the other advising people and whatnot for over 30 years. But I would not still be here if I was living my life, a life a different way. Yeah. I've watched too many of my colleagues, too many of my friends, too many candidates, too many politicians that I've consulted or advised or whatever just get consumed by the game itself. Sure. No, right. It will absolutely take your soul if yeah. you let it. Yeah. And so the way you do that is to set a standard and say, I'm just not going to do that and um, and keep it in perspective. And don't don't sometimes it's a serious ball game, but don't make it so serious. You know, sometimes you just got to say, hey, it's going to be OK. Win, lose or draw, it's going to be OK. Um, I hope that makes sense. Sure. No, absolutely. So, yeah, that shows that you've been able to take the mentorship that was given to you and pass that along yeah. to a whole new generation. And, yeah. and many of those people have gone on. Many of them, many, yeah. many of them have yeah. gone on to what I would consider bigger and better. Uh, many of them are elected now in their own right. Many of them have gone on to far eclipse uh, anything that I've ever accomplished in the political world. Um, and I'm proud of them and they know I'm proud of them. And I let them know I'm proud of them and um, stay, still stay in touch with many of them. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's that's, you know, it, when I see somebody go forward and do bigger and better and they're doing it the right way, what I would consider the right way. And I take a certain amount of, you know, I don't want to say pride, but I'm like, that makes me feel good. It makes my heart feel good. Sure, and it should. And it's not in vain, right? That what I'm doing is not in vain. Purpose. Yeah, that's yeah the purpose. I mean, the that's greater right. purpose of yeah. what we're here for. Yeah, exactly. Right. 
And let me brag a little bit on our Gaston County folks down here, because I do know a lot of the, the people that you're speaking of. And during these campaign seasons, uh, they have held themselves to that same high standard. That's uh, great. Yeah. So there are a lot of I know there are a lot of people who don't, um, but they there were multiple occasions where things came up and could have really gotten sideways. Um, now, I'm the kind of guy who wants to tell the whole truth on the other side. <laughs> you know, if something comes out, I want to see it on the front page. Um, but that's not always the best way. Sometimes it has to happen. Sometimes it does happen. But for you to say, like you said, you have a clear conscience because you weren't the uh, hanging out the dirty laundry and all that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. That's impressive. If you live by the sword, you'll die by it. I do believe yeah. that. Right. You live by it, you'll die by it. And, um, you know, just not my cup of tea. There you go. Cool. All right. So, all right. Now you picked, you picked for your fast five. Remind me again, you picked the men, five men, five men. I think you've already mentioned a couple of them. Yeah. And I'll mention it. Yeah. You know, um, my dad, number one, um, first and foremost, my dad, uh, Wait, I'm, and, I'm supposed and, to say the fast five, sorry, the fast okay. five now go ahead. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, my father, um, on top of being a godly man, he just taught me how to be a man. And I, you know, and, and just to live life, uh, how to love your family, um, how to love your wife, um, but how to be tough when you need to be tough, um, stand up when you need to stand up, be gentle when you need to be gentle. Um, he's just a good Southern man and taught me how to do that. The greatest testimony I got on that from or compliment, it's, it wasn't to me, it was actually to my father. He doesn't even know this was actually Dan Forrest, our previous lieutenant governor, when his father died. And they had an, uh, 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 kind of um, uh, an estranged relationship for a while, and then it was reconciled later in life before his father died. And he just told me one day out of the blue, he knew my father, he knows my father, and just said, you know, you're lucky to have a dad that taught you how to be a man. Wow. Just mm -hmm. taught you how to be a man. And that's no disrespect to his father because they reconciled right. in life, and his father became a Christian late in life because of Dan's influence. Good for him. But, um, you know, I'll use that as the same testimony that I would give to my dad. He just taught me how to be a man. Right. Um, I would say the same thing about my two grandfathers, both of which have passed away. My, my Robert Jolly was my mom's father and uh, was probably closer to him. Uh, and he only died maybe eight, nine years ago uh, at 92 years old. But he was dyslexic. Um, you know, he was born in the 20s, back when they didn't know what dys dyslexia was. He never could read and write his entire life, but yet he was gainfully employed, uh, worked with his hands, uh, was a you know more of a blue collar guy who actually worked his way into management and um, and provided for his family, paid off his home, always did vacation, raised my mom, and um, despite his not being able to read or write, and most people in the community did not know that all the way up until his death, wow. and um, which I think is amazing. And then my grandfather on the other side, but my namesake, my real name is Harold. I'm Harold the third. My son is Harold. One of my sons is Harold the fourth. Um, he goes by Hayes. I go by Hal. Uh, my dad is Harold Jr. My grandfather, who died when I was in college, was a Harold Sr. And um, he had a third grade education. And uh, but if you know anything about the Brindles uh, department stores that used to be all over North and South Carolina and Virginia and Georgia, he was uh, intimately linked to the Brindle family and was Brendel's first employee. Old wow. man Brendel hired him first. He was the first employee in Brendel's and stayed with him for 45 years, wow. despite having a third grade education. Had he ha had he been given the opportunities, the educational opportunities, or not been born into poverty the way he was born, I have absolutely no doubt he would have been president of the United States. One of the, Just a brilliant man, was a logistical expert mm -hmm. of building supply chain routes and everything like that, and just uh, an amazing man. And a godly man. All of these people are uh, all of the people that I'm in it were godly men. Yeah. Um, I would lift him. I would say uh, I've never met him. Not yet, at least. Uh, David in the Bible. Yeah. Um, by far my favorite. Um, you know, good times, bad times, whatever I read about David. Um, I love that he was not perfect. I love that he uh, knew failure, personal failure, political failure, everything family failure. Um, but you know, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart, uh, because he was quick to repent. And that gives me great hope. It gives me absolutely amazing hope. And so anytime I'm down, I read David. 
and um, all about David. Love everything about it. So would list him. Um, one more. Oh, who's my fifth? I got one more. <laughs> oh, who should I? I don't even know you who my next. Your teacher. Um, man. Your teacher. Who could, well, Van Wade, yeah, is, is a special man because, he, again, he integrated um, right. he integrated current events. I know that sounds so weird, but just he taught me how to start saying, thinking about politics today, right, or culture today, um, but integrated it with the biblical worldview and made me love it. I just I could not get enough of and I didn't know it was politics at the time. I just it was just current events. That's, you know, the class that you would teach. But um yeah, I would list Van Wade in that. Oh. Yeah, you know, I'd be remiss. I'll, I'll do six. Okay, I'll mention Van because <laughs> you can't remember. Right. I, I'll put Dan Forrest in there, and I, I, you know, our former lieutenant governor. And I'll do that for one reason. Um, well, for multiple reasons, but the one that sticks out the most is just like Charlotte Christian. When I was younger, taught you know, I saw people integrating the biblical worldview into their what I call their secular life. Um, Dan is, um, and I work for his mom. His mom's a, a good uh, Christian lady. But, I, but Dan integrated his faith into his politics. Mm. And I don't mean, you know, preaching from the pulpit. and all, I don't mean that. I mean, in ways that people would never know, um, li- like getting ready to go into a meeting and stopping and saying, let's pray about that before we go in there. Right. Um, or, you know, when we, when we had our back against the wall, Many times, especially in that first race for lieutenant governor, when we didn't have a prayer, we didn't have a prayer to win that race. Yeah. Um, but we both had great um, peace inside because it was very prayerful. And I've been a part of many campaigns, run many campaigns. But that was the first campaign, the 2012 campaign for lieutenant governor. That was the first campaign where I can be truthful, where the entire campaign was integrated. Nice. Into it was it was covered in prayer. Uh, and he was adamant about that. I'd never had a prayer team as part of one of our campaigns. First thing he did was say, let's get a group of people to pray for us in all 100 counties and lay down prayer every day in all 100 counties. Cool. I'd never done that before. And I'm like, really? We're going to do that? Like, that's yeah, nice. He was like, we're going to do it first. And, wow, and, and, and everything just kind of clicked. Sure. And so uh, I, I'll, I'll put Dan in. I'd be remiss if I didn't put Dan in there yeah. for that reason, because I am in politics and I learned how to integrate it more directly than ever before than through him, you know, through him. Awesome. That's true. great. Perfect. Well, good. See, everything, every podcast is a little bit different. Every guest is a little bit different. So that's great. You mixed it up a little bit and added one to it. So we have just a couple more minutes here. Yeah. We're going to wrap up. But before you wrap up with your sports story, I have to tell you what your wonderful parting gifts are that I'm going to send ahead. Uh, one of them is, is this the first one? Oh, wait, no, no, that's not first. First is, oh yeah, you will receive your one and only personally autograph. It's not autograph yet, so you know I'm going to personally autograph it. Willie Ace, Chicago Cubs baseball card. It really is me. So I love it. One of your parting gifts. The I other thing it. is this wonderful bottle of <laughs> hand sanitizer. All right. It's got my Wait. mystery. Mr. Stem, edu- Mr. Bill Stem Education, and my Bill Ward Photography. That's a shame plug for my business. Yeah, don't. Okay. Have- <laughs> I love it. And it's, also, it's also a way to get rid of this Staples promotion I jumped on <laughs> for twenty five dollars a bottle. So, <laughs> you're expecting that in the mail. Uh, and you get to you get to choose a Lego superhero. That we will also send. That's connected to STEM. Ed- oh, that's Iron Man right there. Iron Man. Okay. All that's right. That's connected to STEM education because science, technology, engineering, you have to build it sure. because we're not sending it to you built. We're sending it to you in a package. Okay. You can have Thor, Captain America, Doctor Strange, Loki. Oh, I'll take Spider-Man. Doctor Strange. Doctor I'll Strange. Take- because my middle boy loves Doctor Strange. Oh, perfect. Right. Good. All right. Yeah. We'll send that off to you. We literally have. About three minutes. Give us your sports story. Go. Uh, I'm a member related. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sports related story. I know you probably have a thousand of them. Oh, I, I, look, I'll give you straight up. The, the best sports story that I have is just the the time when I was, I guess I was about 16 years old. I can tell you the exact, I don't know the year, but it was Michael Jordan's second year since you like Chicago so much. Um, yeah. um, it was Michael Jordan's second year in the NBA. He was as big as you come. I mean, Air Jordan was in full bloom. He had his poster out where he's like, his legs are spread with the Chicago skyline. Uh, by the way, I went to grad school in Chicago, just so you know that. I went to Wheaton awesome. College in grad school. 
Um, and so I, I, long story short, um, I didn't have a driver's license at the time. My father drove me over. We heard on the radio that Michael Jordan was spotted at his dad's Napa auto parts store because he owned his dad back then was alive and owned a store in Charlotte. Yeah. And uh, we heard it on the radio. And I'm such a memorabilia collector that I already had a stack of Michael Jordan stuff that I was going to get signed because I'm, con I'm I'm confident one day I'm going to meet him and I'm going to get the stuff signed. And my dad said, run in, get that stuff. We were out in the yard and um, got all these magazines and then got in the car, drove over there and got out of the car, went running into the building. And um, I heard from the parking lot, hey, kid, hey, kid, hey, kid. And it wasn't Jordan. It was someone else in a car and a um, very fancy car. And he rolled down the window and said, come over here. And I walked over and I said, what? And he was like, who are you looking for? And I said, Jordan. And he said, look, who's driving the car? And he leaned back so I could see through the car. And it was Jordan. Right, that is awesome. And Jordan said, get out to, to that person. And the guy got out. He was not tall. He, I was taller than him. And he said, that's my brother, Larry. And his brother got out of the car, got in the back. I think his name was Larry. Anyway, got in the back seat. And Jordan said, you sit in the car, kid. So I sat in the car with Michael Jordan and I was like, how did you know? And he said, well, I saw you running in there with magazines. How'd you know I was here? And I said, they announced it on the radio. And he's like, you're kidding me. He said, yes, oh. I'm at the radio station. And he oh. said, when I saw you going in there, he said, I got to stop. And he is at the height of Air Jordan. Yeah. Right. Right. And he stopped for me, a kid, wow. because he saw me running in. And I've, I've known, I collect autographs. So I have a lot of people that, that are, le everybody's lesser than Michael Jordan in the athletic world. And a lot of them just stick their nose up in the air and just walk on past you. He waited on me. He signed everything that I had that day and then popped the trunk and, and got me, gave me some other things wow. um, that you can only get from the trunk of his car, oh, and, yeah. um, which is true. He actually That's says right. that. And uh, yeah. so that was probably one of my cooler sports moments. That might be, our best, story. Might be yeah. our best story yet. That's awesome. That is so yeah. cool. How, We've had how how help. We have. Yes, absolutely. We sure do appreciate it. You've done a great job. Uh, thanks again. We'll have you back again. Uh, yeah. And maybe actually in the Cubs room with your memorabilia. How's that sound? Let's do that. I'd love it. I do appreciate thanks. it.